Let's turn our attention again uh, to that passage in 1 Samuel. We're returning to our uh, series that we uh, were doing uh, at the end of last year and into the beginning of this year through 1 Samuel. It's been a little while since we were um, in this book, but we're returning to uh, the continuing conflict that is going on between David and Saul. At the end of chapter uh, 20, David and Jonathan were uh, saying their parting words to one another. David and Jonathan had um, a a very close relationship. They loved one another deeply. And it came to the point where Jonathan uh, went to find out from his father exactly what his intentions were for David. And he came to see clearly that Saul was um, intent on uh, putting David to death and he goes and he passes that news on to David and David then uh, flees from Saul and that's where we are as we begin chapter 21 Uh, this evening David is continuing to flee from Saul now I'm sure we've all had experiences where something happens that is out of the ordinary something happens and it causes our hearts to drop and suddenly we're afraid about what this might mean. One example might be that um, someone's name flashes up on your phone and they're calling you and it's out of character and suddenly your heart is in your mouth and you're wondering what they could possibly want or, or need at this time and you immediately fear the worst, don't you? Wondering what could have caused them to be reaching out to you at this time or on this occasion. And it's something like that that Ahimelech, the priest, is experiencing in verse 1. As David comes to him in verse 1, we're told that he trembles when David meets him. And he asks, why are you alone? Why is no one with you? This man, David, this mighty warrior, this man who was in command of so many people, who had such a position of authority in, uh, in Saul's uh, kingdom, comes and he is traveling alone or perhaps with just a couple of uh, close servants with him and Ahimelech immediately recognizes that this is out of character that something strange is going on for one like David to be coming to him unannounced and traveling by himself and then we see David's response in verse 2 David answered Ahimelech the priest The king sent me on a mission and said to me, no one is to know anything about the mission I'm sending you on. As for my men, I told them to meet me at a certain place. What do we notice about David's answer? It's a total lie, isn't it? It's a total fabrication. That's not true at all. He's not being sent on a mission from Saul. He's fleeing from him. And so why does David lie? Self-preservation is, of course, uh, a part of it. What did David, though, have to fear from a priest like Ahimelech? Is he lying to a priest because he's worried that Ahimelech might hand him over to Saul? Might Ahimelech and the other priests be loyal to King Saul and immediately hand David over to him? Maybe, but that's unlikely. Ahimelech seems not to know about the feud that's ongoing between David and Saul. So why does David lie to him? Well, the answer to that that is most likely is that David lies to Ahimelech in an effort to try and protect him and his fellow priests. David potentially thinks that if Saul learns that he has been there and that he's asked for provisions and help and has received it, then Saul would be furious. And we've read on chapter 21 into chapter 22. And so we know that that is indeed exactly the case. David thinks that by lying to Ahimelech, at least Ahimelech could honestly say that David had deceived him. That David had said to him that he was on a mission from the king. Ahimelech could say that and he'd be telling the truth. Ignorance is bliss, as they say. Ahimelech could plead innocence in this case and of course that is exactly what he does do when Saul does eventually confront him so David it seems lies to Ahimelech in an attempt to protect him 
But we can't excuse lying, can we, in these circumstances? And David's actions, again, as we have seen in our reading and as we will see as we work through this passage, have consequences, severe consequences for Ahimelech and his family, and not just the family, but the whole of the town. David has fled without food or weapons, and that is why he is here. No doubt Ahimelech was panicking for that exact reason. Why is David turned up by himself? No weapons, no men, no resources. And David now asks uh, Ahimelech to provide him with food there in verse 3. He says, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. And we see in verse 4 um, that there are no supplies. The priests answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here provided the men have kept themselves from women. There are no supplies to hand except that which is holy, that which is consecrated, that which had been laid out for the Lord, the bread of the presence. Uh, the bread that's to hand has been taken from the presence of the Lord and replaced with some fresh bread. But the bread that's been taken was only supposed to be eaten by the priests. The bread was consecrated. It had been, uh, been set apart as holy. And only the priests were supposed to eat it. But as we see in verses 5 and 6, Ahimelech seems happy enough to give this bread to David. He is happy enough for this holy bread to be given to David. How come Ahimelech is reasonably happy to give this bread over to David? Is it because the priesthood has grown lax in the days of Saul the king. We might ask, how could someone die from touching the Ark of the Covenant, but eating the holy bread is okay? Well, it seems that Ahimelech has not grown lax. He makes sure that the men who are going to eat this bread are ceremonially clean. He's concerned about that. So it seems rather than just slipping in his standards, Ahimelech is simply showing mercy to David. The bread intended for holy use was allowed to be used, in this case, for merciful purposes. And of course, uh, we see in the Gospels, don't we, that Jesus uh, commends these events in the Gospel. When his disciples were being criticised for collecting uh, grain from the field to eat as they walked on the Sabbath, Jesus pointed to this account points to this situation where uh, we see that the Sabbath and the ceremonial system were gracious gifts from God. They were mercy from God, kindness from God. And we see Ahimelech demonstrating kindness and mercy to David as he gives this bread to him, this holy bread. A chief reason that the bread of the presence was laid out was to be a symbol of God's ongoing provision for his people. And here in these events, this symbol of God's provision becomes provision from God for David and his men. The message that this bread represented was that provision comes by God's grace, not by the people being deserving. And that's a lesson too for us, isn't it? God's merciful, merciful provision is given to us by his grace not because of our goodness. We receive things from God because of his grace, not because of our goodness. And I wonder, do we receive God's provision in that way? Do we give thanks for each bite of our food, each sip of the drinks that we drink, each breath that we take? Do we give thanks to God for his provision in these things? When we receive even our daily bread, we receive not so much our dues, not so much what we're owed, but we receive unmerited kindness from God. This is often not the attitude that we take in life, is it? As we go through life, we spend so much time, don't we, thinking about what we deserve. We often get offended, don't we? And we often get offended because we think that we're not getting what we deserve. We're not getting the respect that we deserve, for example. We say things like, I don't want much, I just want what I'm owed. 
But as we think about God's uh, gifts to us, we have to flip our thinking. As we think about God's provision for us, we have to flip our thinking. Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Everyone and everything belongs to the Lord. And he gives good things to us, gives essential things to us out of his kindness. This consecrated bread had been given back to the Lord as a symbol of his provision. And now it became a provision for David. Ahimelech showed kindness to David. He showed God's kindness to David. It wasn't just provision that David was looking for, however. We see something else in this passage in verses 7 to 9. Verse 7. Now one of Saul's servants was there that day, detained before the Lord. He was Doeg, the Edomite, Saul's chief shepherd. David asked Ahimelech, don't you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's mission was urgent. The priest replied, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, is here. It's wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There is no sword here but that one. David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. There's an, om- ominous, uh, an ominous note there, isn't there, in verse 7, as we're told this detail that one of Saul's servants was there. We sense that this will come back to haunt David, and indeed it does. But the fact that um, Doeg is even there in the first place is slightly interesting, isn't it? We're told that he's not an Israelite, but he's an Edomite, a descendant of Esau. So what's he doing there in the presence of the Lord? Well, we don't really know. We're not told, except that he was detained before the Lord. It's difficult for us to know what was going on exactly there. Perhaps he'd uh, made a vow that he would stay there for a certain period of time. There's uh, other uh, passages in 1 Samuel where Saul was told to stay in a place for a certain amount of time, and perhaps a similar thing was going on there. But one thing becomes clear as we get to know Doeg a little bit over these couple of chapters is that he didn't uh, have a a genuine life-giving relationship with the Lord as we see what he is willing to do in the next chapter. It's not that he was there genuinely worshipping the Lord. Now it's not ideal, is it, for a close associate of Saul to hear about David's search for a weapon. David, in his haste to flee, had been unable to take any weaponry with him. And he knows that if Saul or one of Saul's men comes across him, he is not going to last very long without a weapon. And so he asks for a weapon, and the only thing that's there is Goliath's sword. And so he takes that on with him. Now, I want to jump at this point a little bit ahead in the story to find out how um, this little section concludes, and then we'll jump back and fill in the gap in the middle. So let's jump forward and see how uh, this story unfolds from verse 6 of chapter 22. Chapter 22 and verse 6. Now Saul heard that David and his men had been discovered, and Saul was seated, spear in hand, under the tamarisk tree on the hill at Gibeah, with all his officials standing at his side. He said to them, listen, men of Benjamin, Will the son of Jesse give all of you fields and vineyards? Will he make all of you commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? Is this why you have all conspired against me? No one tells me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. None of you is concerned about me or tells me that my son has incited my servant to lie in wait for me as he does today. What we see here is Saul has been opposing David And it has been getting more and more severe. But we see there that um, Saul's officers seem to be maintaining some level of loyalty to David. And Saul is growing increasingly paranoid. He accuses his men not just of harboring some loyalty to David, but of full-on conspiracy against him. There in verse 8 he says, Is that why you have all conspired against me? In the face of this subtle loyalty to David, Doeg steps forward. 
We knew, didn't we, that he'd be troubled from as soon as we were told that he was loitering there with the priests. And we uh, have this uh, detail in verse 10. As Doeg steps forward in verse 9, he says, I saw the son of Jesse come to Ahimelech, son of Ahitab at Nob. And then verse 10, Ahimelech inquired of the Lord for him. He also gave him provisions and the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. We find out now that um, the priest had also inquired of the Lord on behalf of David. We weren't told that detail before, but it's saved for this point now. And the reason that this uh, detail is saved for this point in this chapter is because now David and Saul are presented as being polar opposites of one another in this passage. Here in this passage, we're told that David went to the priests, that he went to the priests to inquire of the Lord, as well as to find provision and to find weaponry. So David goes to the priests to inquire of the law, to receive provision and to receive a weapon. What does Saul do in relation to the priests? We see that in this passage as well, don't we? In verses 11 to 19, the king sent for the priest Ahimelech, son of Ahitab, and all the men of his family who were the priests at Nob, and they all came to the king. Saul said, listen now, son of Ahitab. Yes, my lord, he answered. Saul said to him, why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, giving him bread and a sword and inquiring of God for him, so that he has rebelled against me and lies in wait for me, as he does today? Ahimelech answered the king, who of all your servants is as loyal as David, the king's son-in-law, captain of your bodyguard and highly respected in your household? Was that day the first time I inquired of God for him? Of course not. Let not the king accuse your servant or any of his father's family, for your servant knows nothing at all about this whole affair. But the king said, you will surely die, Ahimelech, you and your whole family. Then the king ordered the guards at his side, turn and kill the priests of the Lord, because they too have sided with David. They knew he was fleeing, yet they did not tell me. But the king's officials were unwilling to raise a hand to strike the priests of the Lord. The king then ordered Doeg, you turn and strike down the priests. So Doeg the Edomite turned and struck them down. That day he killed 85 men who wore the linen ephod. He also put the sword, put to the sword Nob, the town of the priests, with its men and women, its children and infants, its cattle and donkeys and sheep. Notice how in that passage, Saul refers to the Lord as simply God except when he orders the priests of the Lord to be killed in verse 19. Do you see how Saul and David are being presented as polar opposites of one another? For Saul, now, David, the priests, and even the Lord are his enemy. On one side is David and the priests and the Lord. On the other side is Saul. And Saul, we see, has the priests killed all of them except one, one of Ahimelech's sons, we see in verses 20 to 23, is able to escape. And in those final three verses, David is portrayed as the protector of the priesthood, while Saul in this passage is the destroyer of the priesthood. Notice in verse 16, Saul says to Ahimelech, you will surely die. Whereas in verse 23, David says to Ahimelech's son, stay with me, don't be afraid, you will be safe with me. What we see here in this passage clearly is that from here on, David and the priests and the Lord are clearly on the same team and the same side. And it's also worth noting from those final few verses that David completely owns up to his mistake, doesn't he? Whilst it's clearly Saul and Doeg who are immediately responsible for the deaths of all of the priests, David too recognises his part in the events that have unfolded. In verse 22, he says to Abiathar, that day when Doeg the Edomite was there, I knew he would be sure to tell Saul, I am responsible for the death of your whole family. David recognises that the careless way in which he spoke has contributed to the death of Ahimelech and the rest of the priests. David owns up to his mistake, recognises it, and commits to doing what he can to make it right. 
whilst with his lie, he surely meant to protect Ahimelech. He recognizes that he has ultimately contributed to their death. And there are two things that we should learn from Ahimelech's fate here and the rest of the priests uh, and what happens to them, but particularly Ahimelech. The first thing that we see here is that showing kindness can be costly. Showing kindness can be costly. Ahimelech would have lived if he'd refused to help David. Simply put, he would have lived had he refused to show kindness to David. And the question for us is, will we be prepared to show kindness when it's costly, to show mercy, to show grace to one another? It's always costly, isn't it, to be, uh, to be gracious and loving towards um, others. And will we do that? Will we look to the needs of others and prefer others' needs to ourselves? There's a lesson that we can learn here. Kindness can be costly. But there's another thing that we see clearly here in this passage, and that is, is that the Lord keeps his promises. The Lord keeps his promises. We might be wondering, well, in this passage where all of these priests are killed, how can we learn that God keeps his promises? Well, do you remember all the way back in 1 Samuel chapter 2? 1 Samuel chapter 2. Flick back with me to 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verses 30 to 36. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 30 to 36. This is uh, the Lord speaking to Eli. Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promise that members of your family would minister before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me. Those who honor me, I will honor, but those who despise me will be disdained. The time is coming when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your priestly house, so that no one in it will reach old age. And you will see distress in my dwelling. Although good will be done to Israel, no one in your family line will ever reach old age. Every one of you that I do not cut off from serving at my altar, I will spare only to destroy your sight and sap your strength. And all your descendants will die in the prime of life. And this was because, um, as we're told there in verse 29 of 1 Samuel chapter 2, And the Lord says to Eli, why do you scorn my sacrifice and offering that I prescribed for my dwelling? Why do you honor your sons more than me by fattening yourselves on the choice parts of every offering made by my people Israel? Because of the sons, uh, because of the sins of the sons of Eli and Eli's failure to rebuke them, there was a promise made to him. And the Lord keeps his word. These priests here were the descendants of Eli. The God, uh, the Lord fulfilled his promise to Eli. And it shows us also that the Lord is able to use even the deep wickedness of Saul to work out his purposes. Saul and Doeg were committing a great evil in killing the priests of the Lord, even while at one and the same time they were fulfilling the the promise, the prophecy that the Lord had given to Eli about what would happen to his descendants. This truth should give us confidence in our own lives and in the world in which we live. Even as great evil surrounds us in this world, God is able to work out his perfect purposes. God is not the author of evil, but he is able to use evil and evil people to accomplish his purposes because of his sovereignty. And of course, even in the midst of great evil in this passage, there is mercy, there is hope. One facing certain death at the hands of Saul finds refuge and safety with the Lord's anointed. He flees to David and David promises him that he will be safe with him. Does that remind us of anything? Does that point us to anything? One who is surely going to die flees and finds refuge and protection and ultimately a new life with the Lord's anointed. Surely that is us and the Lord Jesus, dead in our sins as we are, facing eternal death and judgment. We have a refuge We have one to whom we can flee, the Lord's anointed, the true king. Go to him in faith and we find hope and new life. We flee to him and he says to us, you will be safe with 
me. That's the hope of the gospel, that we can go to Jesus. We can always go to Jesus. As we sang this morning with the kids' song, you can always run to Jesus. Jesus is strong and kind. He brings forgiveness because of his life and death and resurrection. He promises his presence with us through thick and thin. And he promises us the hope of eternal life with him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us. And we pray that you will um, help us to, uh, to take on board the lessons that we learn from your word. We thank you that we see here an evidence of your sovereignty. We thank you for the comfort that we can take in knowing that even in um, the midst of great evil that we see around us, you are still able to work out your perfect purposes. We pray that your sovereignty would be a comfort to us. And Lord, as we see um, Abiathar fleeing to David and hearing those words, you will be safe with me. Lord, might um, that reflect our own experience with the Lord Jesus. Might each of us uh, f have fled to the Lord Jesus and have heard um, the words spoken to our hearts that we are safe with him, that we find uh, forgiveness with him. We find his presence with us through all things. We find the hope of eternal life with him. Might that be true of each and every one of us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's...